Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. So this magisterium, this role of tradition, this this, and it's designed to function. Let's talk about how it functions. It's designed to deal with, uh, if I can say it, new situations that come up that need the judgment of the church. Mm-hmm. And so uh, if Scripture doesn't directly address something, if you have a tradition that comes alongside and this is authoritative, it can be addressed and and solved, if I can say it that way, right. mm-hmm. all at the same time. And again, we're back to this picture of a, of a structure that is at one level very functional yeah. because it solves uh, dilemmas uh, in, in ways that are more mm-hmm. straightforward than perhaps other models. And that's not to deny the the debates with with it, those different voices you're talking about right. within historic Catholicism. Not we we tend to look back and think all Catholicism has been unanimously what it is today. Not so. Even even back to the 11th century, the debate over whether Mary was born without sin. Anselm said, "No, you can't say that." So did Aquinas. He said that takes away the glory from Christ. And yet on the other side was the Admir and then Duns Scotus mm-hmm. arguing, no, for her to be the vessel of the Savior's birth without sin, she too must be without sin. So you have these debates going back and forth that are formalized, sometimes centuries later, the Council of Trent or then, of course, Vatican well, I. Immaculate and Conception so doesn't take place as a formal doctrine that's recognized officially by the church until the 19th century. Yes. So, I mean, so you're, you're, you know, mm-hmm. again, we've got this model of watching people reflect, reflect, and, and even though this move towards infallibility and in decision making is somewhat selectively exercised, it's selectively exercised at very key points um, to resolve things. And sometimes it may take centuries before a, an official stamp is there, but you should never forget that that official stamp is actually reflecting, because of the role of tradition, mm-hmm. a long conversation that has been taking place in which this formal stamp at the end, my, my German picture of the stemple and the role of the stemple in German yeah. culture where you stamp something and that makes it official. It becomes, becomes what they call dogma Exactly. At that point. Rather mm-hmm. than just doctrines mm-hmm. that different people have held different opinions, it becomes a dogma of the church that is mm-hmm. now binding mm-hmm. on all people in the church. Okay. Well, that's the magisterium and the role of scripture and tradition. It's very clear that in Protestantism, of course, with the sola scriptura, you don't have tradition functioning in nearly the same way. There may be traditions, little t, yeah. operating in various denominations that help to define what they are sociologically mm-hmm. and how they operate and what they hold to and won't let go. But it, de- but it isn't handled in the same kind of way, generally speaking, in the Protestant tradition. The the claim always is, it, if you can't take it back to scripture, then then something's missing. Uh, and, and it is it doesn't quite have the level of uh, of authority and bindedness, if I can say it that way, generally there, speaking. There is the issue of the Eastern Orthodox as well, mm-hmm. which do not approach tradition the same as the Roman Catholic Church. They okay. go back to the seven councils okay. ended in the 8th century, and those become the absolute that interpret Scripture, but then there are various traditions with small t that come after that. So they have certainly rejected the infallibility of the Pope and Mm -hmm. and his primacy as well. And that constitutes another major group of uh, Christendom. So you've got basically three models, if I can say it that way. You've got the sola scriptura model, which is Protestantism. You've got Scripture and tradition together in the Roman Catholic Church with that tradition ongoing through the authority of the Pope. And then in between, if I can say it that way, you've got the Greek Orthodox Church, which has a role for tradition, but that tradition is defined in relationship to councils primarily as opposed to an ongoing office that now uh, um, takes care of things. Uh, You've got the Anglican Church and some other things in there, too, with the Archbishop of Canterbury and decisions to be made. But that basically gets the the spectrum. Yeah, I mean, and and the Anglicans are in in, in, in kind of a similar Mm -hmm. role of playing between their their (laughs) – Yes. Uh, they're hybrid Protestants, I mean, maybe maybe or hybrid Catholics. I'm not sure which yeah. which label to give them because they they fall in between. Of course, the origins of the of the Anglican Church uh, had very little to do ultimately with theologies. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation, probably a whole other podcast when we want to talk about uh, kings and queens and. All that kind of thing. Um, let's go to another big area that is important that we've alluded to, and that um, we we see the church as this um, interpreter on the one hand, 
Now let's come to the doctrine of justification and think through the role of the church, not just as interpreter, but also as, to some degree, mediator of mm -hmm. blessing, because I think this is another, if we think of sola scriptura as being one big difference uh, hermeneutically, this is the other big area mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that we walk into, how justification is seen and the church's role in saving. Uh, if I can say it that way. Um, so um, what are we dealing with here, sure. Michael? One thing we have to make clear is that um, no official church doctrine would – Roman Catholic Church dogma would say that uh, people are saved by works. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely reprehensible. Yeah. Now, at, at popular lay-level folk theology, some people may think that, but some people in the Protestant tradition think that. Uh, they would say that we are absolutely saved by grace, but how they define that grace and how you receive that grace is really the issue. And so in the medieval as well as the post-Reformation Catholic Church, grace is uh, treated almost as if it's a, a substance, something that can be dispensed through various avenues of change or means. Um, through the magisterium, through the official ordained leadership of the church, participating in, in, um, in various rites that are prescribed, uh, the mass, the Eucharist, baptism, the various sacraments, that these things become means of saving grace, grace that uh, improves you, perfects you, moves you more and more toward the goal of salvation. So justification really is a is seen as a process in which you participate in the life of the church, and the more receiving grace, grace. You have the better off you, you are. are. Yeah. yeah, and that, yeah. that's a cr somewhat crude way of saying it. Yeah. But in contrast to the Protestant model, um, grace is something we also believe in. Means of saving grace, we would. Protestants would say it is the word and faith. Mm -hmm. So by grace are you saved through faith. It's interesting when you look at commentators in the medieval period on um, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, Protestants read that and they think, how could Roman Catholics not see? It's by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. Well, you see comments on that that say, well, it's by grace that you're saved through the faith, mm -hmm. meaning the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. faith. And that, that not of yourselves, the whole system itself is a gift of God. So you have ways of working around these things. Um, so they would definitely say you're saved by grace, but how you receive that grace and what that grace does and whether it's a one-time entrance into the life, the Christian life, or if it's a constant moving, movement toward salvation, um, that's really the big difference between um, – Protestantism after Luther in the Roman Catholic Church, and so this is why the Mass becomes such a central feature, essential of, uh, of the of the Roman Catholic process. Yeah. I used to always ask myself, why do you go to Mass every day? I mean, it took mm -hmm. to a very faithful Catholic. I mean, it just it just seemed uh, for coming out of I came out of a Protestant tradition, obviously, so it seemed odd that yeah. it would be every single day. Mm -hmm. But this idea of the dispensing of grace on a daily yeah, basis. why would you eat every day? That's exactly. the same kind of question. That's you right. need the nourishment yeah. Yeah. in the process. And, and so the picture is of the way in which uh, in which the Mass is executed. Let's talk a little bit about the theology of the Mass itself. Because could, could I go back just a little bit, though? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, because I think what we're talking about, even in terms of justification, is important. All the way back to the fall. How mm -hmm. is the fall interpreted when Adam and Eve uh, ate of the fruit and were alienated from God? It's very interesting that the Catechism itself says that Adam and Eve transmitted to their descendants human nature wounded by their own first sin, hence deprived of original righteousness. And right after that, again, weakened, human nature is weakened in its powers. They don't see, as Luther and Calvin argued, that there is a deadness in sin mm -hmm. and transgression, blinded by Satan it's uh, damaged, and all the rest. It's devastating. <laughs> yes. And so that, has, that, that plays into, then, how are we made right with God? Mm -hmm. As Adam and Eve were apparently brought back to zero, but then the actual becoming righteous that becoming just is that working out of the process. And so the church becomes this repository of saving grace, just as with the Bible we were talking about. In a sense, the Bible is the product of the church. The church is God's community. And so it's the community through which he saves the world. And so God, through Christ and through now the vicar of Christ, the pope and the sacraments, it is that means by which God distributes saving grace into the world. 
which does bring us to the mass. But of course, you have you know, baptism is mm-hmm. that which cancels original sin, and therefore is the beginning of membership into that covenant community. And then on from there, the mass being the one we typically focus on, as that uh, that eating of the the flesh and blood of our Savior as an ongoing uh, f- physical, spiritual. Uh, uh, transmission of saving grace into our lives as we uh, are then justified or made righteous step by step in kind of a synergistic way uh, before God. So our okay, human so tra- effort together with God's grace working in us. So transubstantiation, let's get to the technical terminology here. Um, transubstantiation is the idea that the elements during the Mass become the body and blood of Christ, so you partake, if I can say it again, again, of that which Christ has supplied, um, taking uh, John 6 in a very, very literal kind of way, in an ongoing kind of way. Um, and, and so uh, th- th- that actually is the theology through which this ongoing grace is communicated, right, in the yes. – in the, in the, right. Uh, mysterious and miraculous transference of this presence of Christ into the elements which you then partake in that sustains you. Right. So the, the, at the moment that the priest says, this is my body, the, mm-hmm. the invisible, imperceivable essence that you can't – you couldn't see it in a, even in an electron microscope, but it's there in a miracle. It contains then the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And that becomes then the means, the fuel or the nourishing, uh, spiritual and physical nourishment as you partake of it, it becomes part of you and transforms you and, and makes you more and more righteous. So that, and that's an essential part of their, that's why it's the same. In fact, um, the, um, you have Protestants in the Reformation complaining about the idolatry of the Mass because if it's true that that, that, that Eucharist is the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of the God-man Jesus, it was a logical step to, to worship that and venerate that as God. But if the theology is not right, mm-hmm. then the Protestants were right that this is idolatry. So now, in that con- was the controversy. In contrast to that, we have the Lutheran doctrine of consubstantiation, which says that and you, you know, I'm not a theologian, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, <you are>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, which says that uh, I like to call it the over, under, around, and through view that sure. G. Christ surrounds the elements that he's pre- he's spiritually present, but he's not in the elements themselves. Well, the elements don't become right. Don't that's become. The that's right. Don't become the body into, and right. uh, body and blood of Christ. Uh, he's he, he he's, he's in a, with and under. He's everywhere. He's everywhere, but. In the elements. Luther uses the example of you take a, a hot a rod of iron and put it in the fire, and it turns red and takes on characteristics of fire, but the, what, the iron itself is not actually changed into fire. So that's kind of the idea of concept. Okay, and then obviously a third view that you have that, uh, that Luther and Zwingli got into is the memorial view, that you're simply commemorating um, the death of Christ and that there's nothing – Happening with the elements, or, or, Under, or, or around the or elements, yeah. or, or, mm-hmm. or whatever, and of course the famous Marburg controversy mm-hmm. that would, that prevented the Swiss and German Reformations from coming together, where the legend is that that, that Luther carved into the wood uh, when his discussion with Zwingli, you know, this is my body, and mm-hmm. basically said, until you can tell me what the meaning of is is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this doesn't mean what it says, and we've got a problem. It was the only problem out of fifteen, supposedly, that they could not solve yeah. mm-hmm. and come to agreement on. So, so this is this, this has not been an insignificant conversation in the history of the church. This has been a major issue because of where it comes from, where it starts off with. It starts off with this transubstantiation idea and the elements becoming the body and blood of Christ. There's even a little distinction between the Calvinist sacramentalist sure. view mm-hmm. and, and the memorial, the, the, the Zwingli view, or at least what today would typically be a, a, a usual uh, Baptist or other view. That is, this is simply a memorial. It is a symbol of what our Lord has done. There's not necessarily any spiritual presence in that. It has to do with my faith, mm-hmm. even though we may be judged if we partake it unworthily. But the sacramentalist view yet can apply to a, a, a 
a Presbyterian or other perspective where there is literally the spiritual presence of the Lord there at the taking of the Lord's Supper, mm-hmm. and therefore the judgment is – So is, it's not the elements per se, but it's right. the meal as a whole and the feel Christ of the meal is, as a whole. Right. And yes. Calvin would describe yes. it as the Holy Spirit is binding together the co- gathered community in Christ as if he were – Present by mediation mm-hmm. of the Spirit, He's the host of the meal. Yeah, I've as heard if pres- we were sitting at the table with Christ at the last. I've supper. heard Presbyterians describe it as a kind of covenant renewal in which mm-hmm. you're reaffirming your yeah. commitment to the covenant. And there's a very much a, uh, it's very much a spiritual affirmation that's going on with a sense that Christ is present. That the feeling is is if you leave it as a memorial, that's almost too detached. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're not yeah. saying enough about about the specialness of what the meal right. is. Okay, well we've 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 worked our way through that. Let's talk. Come back to justification because I think this is important. Um, the idea that justification is something, if I can say it, is something that happens to a degree in a moment that makes you saved. If I can, mm-hmm. I'm going to put it in real crass and perhaps oversimplified terms, as opposed to the idea of justification almost being this ongoing process, process that yeah. never ends uh, until you get to glorification. Mm-hmm. Um, is that another difference that we're talking about here? Yeah, the, generally Protestants speak in terms of a declaration of righteousness. Justification is that moment that you are you are now saved. And God says you are righteous mm-hmm. because of yeah, what Christ you've has been done, declared righteous, and that's done. Even though you aren't actually doing righteous things, you're right. not some, so you're declared righteous, and then sanctification. And this is the, mm-hmm. one of the geniuses of Protestantism. Justification becomes the the one event that ent- that you enter into salvation. Then we have a new term. Um, sanctification, that is that process, the progressively being mo- made more and more righteous and So it's recognizing that. something very similar that Catholics also recognize, but it's exactly. defining it and framing it in a completely different yeah, kind of frame. Yeah, and the sanctification doesn't, isn't the thing that saves you, it is a result of the saving, the condition of being saved, a result of the justification. So there's a sense for a Protestant in which salvation is very much already not yet, if I can say mm-hmm. it that yeah. way. You've yeah. already saved, you've been justified, you've been declared righteous, but now there's the working out of what that means in the life and the effects of, of the giftedness that mm-hmm. you've received as a result of being saved, the Spirit and the work of the Spirit. And Protestants life, even believe in, in means of sanctification. There are things that you do and get gathering in the community, worship, reading scripture, prayer, that contribute to that. So we're not that different But that from, doesn't get you saved. Exactly. It maintains It maintains – it, it produces spiritual your, growth, it, yes. It maintains the health of your yes. being saved. The idea is there's an imputation of our sin to Christ and his righteousness imputed at the moment of saving faith to us. Now, that doesn't deny, because there's a word group that Daryl right. knows all about, right. the dikaios and, mm-hmm. and dikaiosune. Right. We still are to be growing in righteousness, it's kind of the same word, justification or righteousness. Uh, we're to be growing in that through our life. So it's, it is a once imputed righteousness of Christ to us at the moment of saving faith. But that does work out through our life. We call it sanctification typically in our evangelical circles. Yeah. Yeah. But the words are very similar in, of course, the Greek New Testament. Yeah. yeah. These are theological terms. You can't find – you know, you go to the New Testament, sanctification doesn't always mean the process of spiritual growth as mm-hmm. we use it. We're, we use mm-hmm. these terms to, so we can distinguish between that which happened once in the past, our initial – Salvation, and then that which is continuing on progressively. But what the Roman Catholic rejects is that there is an imputed righteousness of Christ to us at the moment of salvation, that we are counted as fully righteous in the sight of God. Right. You know, it's interesting because in the New Perspective discussion, and this introduces a whole mm-hmm. other dimension of this that has come on in which Protestants have been debating exactly what justification means against yeah. its Jewish background. The whole teaching of imputation has also come up for conversation again from which Within a Protestant, uh, within a Protestant background, and the emphasis is, you don't see that many passages that really are clearly uh, teaching an imputation. I mean, you, most people will acknowledge that the Second Corinthians five twenty is is probably the clearest uh, imputation passage we have in the New Testament. Uh, but beyond that, how many other passages actually explicitly talk about imputation? You know, we can talk about substitution, we can talk about representation, but imputation that, that that Christ's righteousness is completely imputed and put in my place, it's more than a declaration of righteousness that Christ has achieved for me, is something that's also being discussed among mm-hmm. among Protestants today. Um, 
but that's a whole nother podcast, and that's with a whole nother panel. Um, let's let's deal with uh, the priesthood of believers quickly, because um, uh, I think we've pretty much sure. set the table by much of what we've said. Um, one of the standouts I remember uh, I was taught uh, I, I majored in. European history and really concentrated on Reformation and uh, Renaissance and Reformation up to the Enlightenment uh, in that time. And I had uh, I had a student of one of the most famous Reformation historians operating in the humanities, uh, a guy named Lewis Spitz. His I had one of his students at the University of Texas, and I remember um, two things being emphasized uh, in in his presentation of the Reformation. He would emphasize the sola scriptura debate and the role of Scripture vis-a-vis -vis tradition. And then the other thing that he would emphasize in presenting this was the priesthood of the believers, that the idea that there is a priesthood of believers that's important. In fact, let me segue back to the Mass to talk about this. I think there was a time, I think I remember this correctly, in which during the Mass uh, a, a lay person will only get one of the elements. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, and, and so mm -hmm. to suggest, and, and it, you know, if you think back and you think about this, you will you understand what's going on. That the the, it's, the symbolism is very thought through. So the lay person only gets one of the elements. The priest, the priest gets both. takes yeah. the both, and as a representative on behalf on yes. behalf of the laity who are attending mm -hmm. the service. It was a huge issue even before Luther. It was yeah. John Huss was a big advocate of having the Eucharist in both kinds. It was a huge issue. And so that's very, very important. And, yeah. and, you, and if you just think about that and the symbolism of what that represents, then we move very easily to why the priesthood of the believers is a big deal. Yeah. Because now everyone is equally – has equal access to God. There is no other – uh, mediator between God and man other than Jesus Christ. There's no church coming alongside. There's no priest coming alongside. What we get is um, is the priesthood of all believers in which everyone ha has access to the same uh, level of grace and has the same status before God. Yeah, there, there's uh, actually two aspects to that in the Reformation theology. One is that we don't need a mediator other than Christ, and we come by simple faith to Him uh, it's not the mediation of the church, just as you describe. The other aspect that was really emphasized by the Reformers as well was um, believers are each other's priests, that we are praying for one another. All of the one another's in the New Testament be takes on a whole new life in the Protestant church. So, so that's the emphasis on community. Community as well. So that's there's right. the individual, I don't need someone to – and that's right. true. Right. It is my own faith. People can't have faith for me and this kind of thing. But then there's also the horizontal. priesthood of believers, the yeah. horizontal, and this, these are two things that have – I think sometimes as you go f forward from the Reformation, the individual mm -hmm. part is emphasized, and we forget that we are each other's priests to hold each other accountable, confess our sins to one another. And so what's interesting is that which was reserved just for the magisterium, the ability to bind and loose, to forgive and withhold mm -hmm. forgiveness mm -hmm. through the sacraments and through penance and such, that was just the role of the priest – now, in, from Luther on, was we have the ability to confess our sins to one another, uh, pronounce forgiveness, as Scripture says. So the whole – the binding and the loosing and the forgiving and the holding accountable and exhorting to love and good works becomes uh, – we all have a set of keys now. So, we are so rather than having a structure that goes like this, you have a structure that goes like that. Exactly. And it flattens yeah. everything out. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's a significant difference. Yeah. And, and it's, I, I, there, it goes back to even the Old Testament. Let's face it, as, mm -hmm. as the church grew and saw itself more and more as the new Israel, mm -hmm. then the hierarchical – a paradigm that we see in the Old Testament of the high priest and then the, the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, mm -hmm. you see all of that being adopted, assumed, including the vestments and mm -hmm. everything else, the, the military. You know, you had a very centralized kingdom in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But with the New Testament, that seems to be inverted as suddenly the world is our parish. Go into all the world, mm -hmm. preach the gospel. There's no longer a Jerusalem to which we call the nations to worship, rather we're sent out where two or three are gathered. Yeah. There I am. We are now not only priests, but sons and daughters of the living God. There's a lot of things that shift between Old and New Testament, and yet as time went on and the church saw itself, Augustine's city of God and so forth, mm -hmm. as the new Israel, the paradigm of the Old Testament was assumed by mm -hmm. the church. And well, so we came back to this 
uh, hierarchy of priests and all the rest. The other thing that's going on here, and I haven't used this metaphor yet, but I was planning to, is is that the Roman Catholic Church is very much a sponge in the way it absorbs what's going on culturally around sure. it, and the way it mm-hmm. adapts it. Uh, and I, the, the, there are two scenes in my mind that show this. And so when you pull to the the background of the Old Testament, the other background that's also very much in play is this idea of the church being being a kingdom. In the model of what we get out of the Roman Empire yes, being the sure. substitute and replacement mm-hmm. for the Roman Empire. So we get a title for the Pope that actually matches the title that you gave to the emperor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, the jurisdictions yeah. for dioceses just followed the standard political boundaries. It, it, so the, it's a political yeah, structure as well that yeah. has nothing to do or not that much to do or as much to do with the Old Testament as the social political model that you had coming out of the Roman Empire and, and the associations of be, it being the replacement in some ways for Rome. And what I mean by a sponge is it culturally abs- absorbs what's around it so that, for example, when you go to Guatemala and you go to certain places, you see the syncretism between pagan worship and practice, which the Catholic Church has absorbed like a sponge, re-signified in terms of its Baptized meaning and it. sanctified it yeah. mm-hmm. so that yeah. so that the move that a person comes coming out of paganism to Roman Catholic Church, uh, if they come out of local religions into the Roman Catholic Church, is not that great for them to make, and they have all these things that go alongside. And, and the thing that struck me living in Europe, this is uh, part of part of living in Europe and you go to the Catholic sections of Europe and you see things and practices that you associate, if you know European history at all, that you associate with things that happen in the political structures that now have shown up in the Catholic Church, you see um, and the 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 uh, the veneration of the saints, for example, and the way in which uh, that operates, and and other practices, this this sponge where you take things that were done out of a pagan pol- mm-hmm. polytheistic context, and now have been Christianized and sanctified, if I can say it that way, mm-hmm. and are now applied and given new meaning, so that it so it becomes safe, but it's usable. And the distance a right. person has to move in order to move from wherever they've been into Roman Catholicism is not as great and as radical as if you say, oh, polytheism, you don't, you don't do any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you cut, that's all cut off. That's, there's, there's nowhere to go there. Um, it's, it's one of the sociological phenomena, and one of the things that I hope people are getting as we're talking our way through this is to see how sociologically structured uh, Roman Catholicism is to deal with people moving out of one religious environment into another and making the, the Catholic Church kind of a, an acceptable and easy place structured, structurally to mm-hmm. land, if I can say it that and way. And that's entitled uh, Pagan Religions or Primitive Religions are – are considered officially mm-hmm. divine forms of pre-evangelism mm-hmm. to lead people into the church. Well, again, you can see how they've structured their mm-hmm. they they've structured the way they look at things to make these moves uh, uh, more gradual and le- in some ways less yeah. radical than mm-hmm. uh, than generally speaking you see, you hear in a Protestant context. Well, that I'm going to use that to transition to the last topic that we're going to talk about, and that's the cult of the saints, which leads into the Mariology. Probably, if you were to ask two people what makes Catholicism different from Protestantism on the street, I think the two mm, answers yes. that you would get, they would say, it'd be two. Just think of two people, okay? Think of the Pope and think of Mary. Okay, and those would be the two differences that you'd immediately uh, uh, sense. So we're going to kind of end where we began by coming to this second second uh, person who uh, so dominant in Catholicism. Let's start off first by probably asking this question: Why is Mary so important uh, to Catholicism, uh, and why has she not had, relatively speaking, uh, the same level of importance in Protestant uh, Protestant yeah. circles? I can answer the second part first. The reason why Protestants don't have a high place for Mary is because the Roman Catholics did. (laughs) So part of it is reactive. When you look at the history of the church, um, though there wasn't prayers to or veneration of Mary early on, there was still a, a high regard for her. Uh, she was viewed as the second Eve who undid what uh, where mm-hmm. Eve messed up. She was viewed as the uh, Theotokos, the mother of God, which originally was not a confession of who Mary was, but a confession of who Jesus was. Mm-hmm. And the idea was, if Jesus is truly the God-man, he was a God-man at conception, at birth, at death, through the whole thing, so confessing Mary as the giver, 
the, the one who gave birth to God was a confession of who Jesus was. That's a Council of Ephesus 431. 431 Council yes. of Ephesus. So that, that was uh, – however, you have language Theotokos, mother of God or God-bearer, in popular piety as they hear that. Uh, really, the the veneration of Mary and the saints is, uh, by most historians' accounts, uh, it, it starts at the popular level, and it just kind of eventually works its way into liturgies and into prayers. It is a sponge, <laughs> yeah. And then eventually, and and surprisingly late in the history of the church, um, the ever virginity of Mary, the uh, immaculate conception. P- many people don't understand immaculate conception is not. The virgin birth. It's not about Jesus. It's Sorry. Mary herself mm-hmm. is born without or is conceived without sin, so that she can be the holy vessel of Jesus. And these things you can see where they start to come in in prayers and liturgies, and then eventually goes go to doctrine, and they're debated. Usually in the medieval period, some are for mm-hmm. it, some against it. Big names too. I'm not talking about just. Uh, we're talking about people like Saint Bernard and Anselm, and these taking different sides on it. And then a century or so later, um, eventually by papal and magisterial authority, become dogma. So it, it has a long and storied history. So when it comes to the doctrines associated with Mary, just to show how light the official sta- mm-hmm. do- dogmatic stamp is, Immaculate Conception, 1854, mm-hmm. Assumption of Mary, 1950. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we're, <laughs> we're in the very recent times mm-hmm. in the big scheme of Which things. Which doesn't mean people started believing them then. No. They believed them for centuries. That's when it becomes, oh, now you must believe this That's mm-hmm. right. as a Christian. This becomes yeah. an official, official doctrine of the, mm-hmm. of, of the church. Now, um, so, so, the, so the cult of the saints in Mary, I, I have always seen, and I, the Eastern Orthodox has this too, sure. so it's mm-hmm. not just right. the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I tend to see it as a, as a, um, a move towards being sensitive to the polytheistic background that a lot of people came out of, and the reverence of the saints isn't a way of making other gods, but it is a way of acknowledging the greatness of the saints and give people many models and symbols to attach themselves to sure. in their religious devotion. So heroes. That, was, yeah, yeah, heroes, it's exactly. It's a thin veneer in, in Latin America, for example. The uh-huh. saints really can often be seen as uh, the gods of uh, indigenous African religions and so forth, or Indian religions behind them. Yeah. I think uh, I think having been in Latin America, mm-hmm. this we have traditionally emphasized the deity of Christ. And so, as we think of the medieval church and all the rest, how does a person then relate to God? Well, Jesus was tempted, but he's God. Of course, he's not going to sin. Mm -hmm. And so, Chalcedon was warped, that language, mother of God, which we all affirm understood rightly, came to mean that Jesus, Jesus is completely God. He's not going to fail. So, he... But but Mary, she's truly human and full of grace. So we can't we can't relate to Jesus as the model. We can't be like Jesus as the model because in our minds we say, oh, he's just different. That's right. Mm-hmm. And, but we can relate to anybody else as a model and an example. And so we just stack up these well, models and examples. Mary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would also say that with the cult of the saints, and by cult we aren't trying to be derogatory. It's yeah. the the. Yes. Veneration. The veneration the of in the in, mm-hmm. so the with the veneration of the saints and intercession of the saints, they will officially they'll say we aren't praying to or worshiping the saints. We are praying through, through them. them. As as I would might say, Daryl, could you pray for me? I'm going through something hard. Um, you would mm-hmm. say, sure, I'll be praying for you, and you intercede for me. Well, the idea is they're still alive, mm-hmm. and they're even more glorious than they were in this life. They're part of the cloud and of they're witnesses. they're part of the cloud of witnesses. That's one church of departed and living, and so therefore they're going to continue to intercede for us and pray for us, and it makes sense that we should be able to ask for their prayers as well. So that's the logic. Now, there is – very briefly, there is a uh, an eschatology attached to this and this realized eschatology that says um, the saints are currently experiencing this growth in in glory, whereas in the earlier church um, there was a sense that that didn't happen until resurrection, you had to wait for this. So there's some of that playing in that um, uh, in the early centuries would have actually disallowed that kind of theology to develop. But after the third or fourth centuries, when you start seeing not just commemorating the saints and mm-hmm. the martyrs, which happens right away, mm-hmm. just as we visit the graves and put up memorials, it, 
famous people, but the intercession appealing to them as not just means of prayer, but also they're able to yeah. to spill over their ec- overabundance of grace to us. Coming back to Mary just a little bit mm-hmm. here. As the mother of God, perpetual virgin, ever virgin, uh, immaculately conceived, so her her, as you've said, Mike, uh, her uh, conception was without sin, and her ascension into heaven, and her role as co-redemptrix, as uh, the one who, because of her purity, uh, was partner in, even allowed the incarnation. She was there through Jesus's of course, birth, childhood, his ministries at many points at the cross, at the resurrection. She was there in the upper room in Acts 1 praying. Uh, for a good reason, far more candles are burning to Mary mm-hmm. than to anyone else in a Catholic church. She is the mother of our Lord, and therefore she is the mother of his body, and his body is the church, the church. So, so she is the mother of the church. He is the creator of all things, so she is the the mother of angels. Mm -hmm. She is the mother of humanity, as is sometimes said, the queen of heaven. Mm -hmm. And and uh, that's why she sits at the top at many churches, the Roman Catholic Church. Does indeed, yeah. And of course, with John Paul II, who was a Marian pope, Mm -hmm. there was a petition with at least seven million names on it, wanting him to make as dogma Mm -hmm. Mary as co-redemptrix, to actually use that terminology because it's with her cooperation that redemption is offered to the human race. That by the grace of Christ and God himself, of course. Mm -hmm. So that's how it's seen. Um, obviously, very, very different in Protestantism. Protestants, generally mm-hmm. speaking, don't do this. Like I say, the Greek Orthodox do have an element of this, uh, but, uh, but Protestants generally do not. Uh, and it's back to this, uh, I, if we can say, uh, sola scriptura, mm-hmm. uh, sola Chris, Christi, mm-hmm. okay? Um, uh, sola fide, uh, emphasis that is a part of Protestantism, mm-hmm. that we have these very focused, uh, Christologically, um, uh, how can I say it, uh, laser-like uh, way that we deal with mm-hmm. salvation so that we only have Scripture, we only have Christ, it's only by faith. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, those are some of the emphases that you see Protestants making, and we don't see this development. Now, there are a couple of things that we haven't talked about that I'm not going to take the time to, but I'm going to mention it here because they are part of the conversation. Obviously, we have a different uh, – a different look of Scripture itself when we think of the Old Testament, when we think about mm-hmm. Catholics versus Protestants. We haven't mentioned that, but you have the – what are known – what what will sometimes be called the apocryphal books mm-hmm. or sometimes called the deuterocanonicals. Um, these books, uh, mostly uh, these Jewish works that First Maccabees, uh, uh, Second Maccabees, uh, um, Sirach, 14 books total that, that make up a difference, which allow room – for some other teachings to come in, things like purgatory, which we haven't talked about. That's another difference that Catholics and Protestants generally have. And the support for those kinds of doctrines you don't see in the traditional right. Hebrew Old Testament, but you do see it in some of these uh, apocryphal texts. So we've got some other things that are also if, – if we were to make a more comprehensive list and be really obsessive about it, we, we could we could keep going for another hour and add add some more things. But I think we've talked about the big ones. Mm-hmm. Um, we've talked about the role of Scripture in relationship to tradition and how that produce, produces a completely different model. We've talked about how the Roman Catholic Church sees the church as, as in some sense, a mediator of blessing and the continuing of grace because they have a different view of the way justification works. Uh, we've seen uh, the role in which the church has as this kind of sponge to help people adapt from whatever non-Christian background they come out of into the church and make that walk across that bridge less radical than perhaps it is in Protestant tradition, that kind of thing. And we've seen the very, uh, very effectively, I think, a sociological structure that has some very um, simple categories to work with. There's one pope, there's one church, there's one dogma. Uh, and even though the Catholic Church is big and there are lots of conversations happening within it, uh, there is a very clear place where the buck stops in the Catholic Church that you tend not to see as clearly um, in, in Protestant circles. 
uh, and with Protestants being much more open-ended in terms of the way those those things operate sociologically. So I want to thank you for taking uh, the time to come thank and you. discuss uh, the Thanks. Catholic um, Church and Roman Catholic Church and the difference between them and Protestants with us. And we hope this has been um, beneficial to you, the listener, as you think through, you know, why do we have these differences between Protestantism and, and Roman Catholicism. We've tried to be descriptive here, uh, mostly, and hopefully it's been helpful to you, and we hope that you will come back and sit at the table with us in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.